I mentioned before that in the Java language, there is a construct that you can use to help you trap potential semantic errors in your, in your programming, in your code. So that's what this video is going to focus on mostly now. There's a couple applications of it. You will use this particular construct all the time uh, in your assignments going forward in this particular assignment for this week. Excuse me. And you know, if you if you want to become a professional developer, um, you will use this all the time. Again, you you don't necessarily know what users are going to type, and when you're working with input from users or when you're working with input from other systems, occasionally you get provided input that's not what you're expecting or not what you're looking for uh, or that can potentially cause your problems with the way that you developed your application. So what you need to be able to do is you need to be able to basically try to do an operation on something and if that fails for a reason uh, either because it's bad input or a bad file you're reading in or uh, bad values provided from another system interface you need to be able to catch those so that your application doesn't crash. The easiest way to see this, right, um, in terms of an application crash, is if we just did a print statement where we tr tried to divide by zero, right? We know that we can't divide by zero. If we run this, um, what we're going to see is we get an exception that says you can't run by zero. If we ever encountered an area in our application or in our program where we couldn't, you know, explicitly control, particularly this this denominator value and say we got it from a file, say we got it from a user, if they typed zero or if the file provided the value of zero and we try to do division with zero as the denominator, that would create problems for our program and you see what happens here as it crashes. Um, again, we want to be able to handle this more gracefully. Inside of the Java language is something called a try catch block. Um, now the way that you would use it is you have a reserved word called try, all lowercase, you would use curly braces, so opening and closing. Again, uh, good habit to label your curly braces. And then you have another reserved word called catch, also in blue. With catch, you have to specify what kind of exception you might catch. Uh, in this case, uh, down here, we have a java.lang.arithmetic exception. We could specify that here. However, you don't always necessarily know what kinds of exceptions you might run into. So it, there is a way to, to basically generically specify, I want to catch any exception, and any exception I get, this is what I want to do. Um, but if it's possible or, or you have the, the ability to see that there are certain kinds of exceptions that might happen, and you want to handle, you want your program to handle those kinds of exceptions differently, um, then you can actually specify uh, different kinds of exceptions here uh, and handle them differently. For now and for this class, we're going to keep it very, very simple. And we're just going to connect, catch any kind of exception sort of very generically. So this will be the end of our catch block. Okay. So what this is saying is we're going to try whatever is inside this body of uh, or this block of code right here. Anything between these two brackets, we're going to try to do this with the assumption that, hey, something might go wrong. And if something goes wrong uh, in, in terms of runtime exceptions, in terms of getting something like this where your program just dies immediately where it is, stops in its track, uh, if we run into something like that, we don't want to crash. We don't want to see this kind of errors. Instead, we want to give a more meaningful, useful uh, response to the user so that they know what went wrong and potentially how to even resolve it, right? So let's take this, this division by zero line up here and let's put it back inside of our try block, okay? So inside our try block, we have uh, something that's trying to divide by zero. And what we also have is we have a catch block that says if we run into a problem anywhere inside this try block, we're going to stop execution immediately where it happens, and we're going to drop down in here, and we're going to execute whatever code is in here. In this particular example, what we probably want to do is tell the user that we can't divide by zero. Oops. You cannot divide by zero. Right? If we execute this, if we hit the, the execution button, um, what this is going to do is this is going to try and execute this statement and when it tries to do this math it's going to create this arithmetic exception and so it's going to stop right here it's not going to do anything it's going to anything further in, inside this code block it's going to stop right here it's going to drop down here and it's going to begin executing at the top of this code block and in this case it's very simply just a print statement so let's try and execute this we should see, oops, you cannot divide by zero. 
Notice it didn't print anything from this line. It didn't do anything else. And I'll show you in a second um, that it ignored everything below this line because this is where the error occurred. Um, immediately drop down into here and printed, oops, you can't divide by zero. Uh, you could do, you could have multiple lines in here. You could do, um, you don't have to have just one thing. It's a code block. You can have as many lines as you want. Please run the program again with a different denominator. I spelled that right. If we execute this, you'll see both print statements occur and get printed, right? Um, which is what we're looking for, right? Again, we're trying to uh, gracefully handle uh, anything that could potentially go wrong. Um, if we had something up here, right? Again, this is just a code block. We said 10 divided by two, right? You'll see that we will print five. And then, because we didn't run into a problem here, once we run into a problem, it's right here. This has already happened. This has already been executed. But when we run into this division by zero, we're gonna drop down here and we're not gonna print anything else. To demonstrate that, that basically once we get to that point, if we add another print statement, we'll say, I am here, <laughs> whatever. Um, if we run this, let's see what we get. We get five. Again, this is gonna print five. This is where our five is coming from. This is creating an error, a runtime error. And this never gets reached or executed because we created an error or we ran into an error right here, which means that it stops execution in this code block and it immediately drops down into the catch block and begins to execute um, whatever is down here, right? Um, if we're building on some of the previous videos we've watched this week or, or for this week that you guys have already seen, um, let's, let's just kind of take a look at this a little bit closer and a little bit more uh, with a less trivial example. Um, so suppose we wanted to get imp, imp, um, input from a user. So I'm going to import java.io.star. You should have seen that on the last video. I also told you before that you needed to have throws io exception up here. Um, if you're getting input from a user. Now, uh, I kind of lied before. If you're using a try catch block and you're putting your code where you're getting input from the user inside of your try block, this piece of code is no longer necessary. Um, essentially, this code was compensating for not having a try catch block when you don't have, or when you're trying to get input from a user. So for now, I'm going to uh, remove this um, because what we have here is sufficient. I'm going to create a buffered reader object, just like we did last time. I'm surprised I remember this, actually. Oh, good, I got it right. OK. Usually I have to look that up. <laughs> uh, so what we've just done is we've created our, just like we did in the last video, we created a buffered reader object called n. It's, think of it as just a, a thing in memory. It's a variable called n that happens to be a buffered reader data type. So it's not a string or a double or a Boolean or anything else. The data type of this particular variable is buffered reader. We don't have to understand what's going on here. We don't have to understand why it works. We just have to know that it does. All right, so the next thing we wanna do is um, let's ask the user to um, give us their name. Please type your name. And I'm gonna do a print statement instead of print line. And then the next thing I wanna do is I want to um, get whatever the user types. So I'm going to reference my variable in. I'm going to use that dot operator, get that read line. And when this all executes, basically what will happen is I'll have a thing in memory called name. It's a string data type. And inside that variable will be stored whatever the user typed. Okay. Um, and what we can do is we can test this just to make sure that it's working like we expect it to. Right. So if I print name, what we should see is that uh, I'm asked to type my name. So again, we're sitting right here waiting for this input from the user. If I type my name and press return, it will simply echo my name back to me. Okay, all's well and good. Uh, no exceptions were encountered, no issues, nothing like that. Now, suppose I wanted to um, get and, and this is just a, as an arbitrary, this is a silly example, but suppose I wanted to get the 10th character that the user types, right? Or let's not say 10th, let's say the sixth character. 
Um, what I can do is I can say uh, system.out.println name. If you recall, we have string operators char at, and I want to get the sixth character, which would mean that my string that I'm doing this on, my name string, has to be at least seven characters, right? Because Java is zero based, so the sixth index will actually be the seventh character, right? Again, just to remind you, if we have A, B, C, D, E, F, G, right? If we're looking at indexes, that's 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. So the length of this string is actually, right, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. But the highest indexed is actually 6 because we start at 0. Okay, so what we can see here, if we run this now, or actually I guess what we, if we back up a second, is it possible that we get a name that doesn't have seven characters? Uh, I can think of, you know, plenty off top, offhand, certainly my name, the way I just typed it with Chris, does not have seven characters. If I type a name that does not have seven characters, what's going to happen when I try to execute this code is it's going to explode, right? It's gonna say, hey, you're telling me to give you the character that's the seventh character or the sixth character in this string, but it doesn't have six character, the sixth character, it doesn't have seven characters. So it's going to create an exception that we saw in previous video. So what we want to do uh, is we want to handle that exception, right? We want to print out print line. Your name does not, I'll say it this way, is not at least seven characters long. Right. So now if I run this and I put in a really long name or I type my whole name, say Christopher, right? I have seven characters there, more than seven characters. This will work just fine. And it'll say the seventh character <clears throat> is O. So this is the seventh character right here. However, if I run it again, uh, but this time I don't type Christopher, I type Chris. Essentially this would have created a runtime error. It would have created an exception. But because I have it inside of a try catch block, what it's going to do when it runs into this problem is it's going to drop down inside this catch statement and it's going to print your name does not have at least seven characters or it's not seven characters long. And so effectively we have handled that exception. Okay. Um, again, if we put something after this, you typed plus name, right? If I run this again, if I create input or provide input, Christopher, that has seven characters, we get this print statement executes properly, as does this statement, right? If we run it again, but this time we type something shorter, you're gonna see that this never gets executed, right? Because we run into our problem right here, and here's where we run into our problem, and so uh, we drop down into this next catch block. Um, we can put things outside of this. I am outside my try catch. All right, and no matter what, because we're handling <clears throat> any kind of exception gracefully, our program isn't going to die when we run into problems. <clears throat> Once we uh, finish executing whatever's inside this catch block, uh, we can just keep on going about our merry little way. Uh, now, if no exception is ever encountered here, if we never run into any problems here, this gets ignored completely. The only time this gets executed is when uh, we run into problems up here. Now there's one other thing that you really need to see, uh, and that's that this variable e that we're creating here inside of our catch block actually has some value. If we want to know what kind of exception we ran into, obviously we, we, we know kind of by the way that we designed this example that this is probably going to be the kind of thing that we run into. Uh, however, if um, we, were, we encountered some other error, for instance, or we don't know what kind of error we might encounter, we can use this variable e to help us understand what exactly went wrong. So if we do a print statement and we say we want to print e, and we use that dot operator, 
there's something called get message. And get message will give us kind of a human readable idea of what exactly went wrong. And so we can add that as well. So when we run this, if I type something short like Chris, I'm going to get whatever the error message is. And just to be clear, we can error message. We can label it. We'll get an error message and then we'll get a statement that says your name is not at least seven characters long. And then uh, it will leave this catch block and we'll keep on going down the rest of execution for our program. And in this case, we'll print a statement that says, I'm outside my try catch. So if I run this and I type Christopher, the good case, right? Not a problem. I'm gonna, it's gonna say the seventh character is zero. It's gonna say you typed Christopher. And then it's gonna skip over this, this catch block altogether, go to the next print statement, which says, I am outside my try catch. Now if we rerun it again and we give it bad input, we're going to get the error message is string index out of range and it's giving us the index. And this basically is saying, hey, you're, you're asking me to get the sixth character, but this string that you're asking me to get the sixth character of doesn't have a sixth character. Uh, the next thing it's going to do is it's going to print your name does not have at least seven characters long. And then it's going to again leave this catch block and start to print or, or pick up wherever whatever happens next. In this case, it's just another print statement that says, I am outside my try catch block. All right, so uh, try catches, uh, try catch blocks are very useful. Um, they're very helpful. Uh, you can have uh, multiple catch statements here. Um, it's possible to do that. We did something like uh, IO exception. Oh, it's already been caught because it's handled by this. So we have to put it in order, right? So this is this is the most generic possible case. So <clears throat> by just using exception here. So if anything goes wrong, no matter what, this is the catch block it's going to use. So you always, if you are going to specify the kinds of exceptions that you want to try and catch, this should always be your last um, because it's sort of the catch-all. So if we move this up here, basically what we're saying is if, if we get some sort of input-output exception up here, different than what we're seeing or that we're, what we're trying here. But if we see some sort of input-output exception here, we want to do this. Uh, if we don't see an input-output exception, all other exceptions we see, we want to do this. So you can have multiple catch blocks um, and that's not problematic. That's perfectly fine inside the language. You had some kind of problem with IO, right? So as long as the exception that gets created by this is not an IO exception, you remember it was a Java arithmetic exception, uh, it will ignore this block and it will drop to the next block um, that is capable of catching the kind of exception that it is. And again, this is a catch all. So when we run this, uh, if we type a really or if we type bad input, you'll see this this never gets hit. This gets skipped over completely because the kind of exception is uh, an index out of range exception. It's not a an IO exception. And so we're going to skip that and then we're going to land in this catch all exception bucket. Uh, it's going to execute these lines of code and then it will continue on about its merry way. Okay. So a very, very simple example um, of try catch. Don't forget to pay attention to your curly braces. Uh, again, I advocate that you label them just so you know what's what and you don't confuse yourself. Uh, but if you have any questions around try catch, let me know. Uh, in the next example or in the next tutorial uh, we're doing for this week, it's going to be about converting um, strings to numbers. So you can imagine if we ask the user to type a number and he types a letter, if we try to convert that, uh, we're going to run into problems, right? And so having this try catch block uh, in our back pocket will help us handle um, getting input from a user in a more graceful fashion. If you have any questions, let me know.